I got my brother Steve here, and now we're gonna give you the breakdown. Hoist Gracie in the fight, Shamrock, he wants three. I was there for the first two. Yeah. I, I was Hoist's uh, conditioning coach for this first UFCs. Welcome to the Dean Shaw Media, your host. We got another exciting episode for you. As always, subscribe if you haven't already. My next guest has been chosen by Men's Journal as one of the top 100 trainers in the US. He's been training over half a century. That's more than plenty of you have been living. He was a former strength and conditioning coach for Hoist Gracie. Started training Gracie Brazilian Jiu Jitsu before the UFC. That's why I've got my rash guard on and I'm ready to go ahead and throw my gi on and benefit from his experience and his, from his knowledge. That's why you wanna sit tight and go ahead and soak in some of the great things that he's got to share with us here on The Dean Show with Steve Maxwell. Don't go anywhere, we'll be right back. This is The Dean, The Dean Show. This is The Dean, The Dean Show. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean, the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. This is the Dean Show. Steve Maxwell, my friend, how are you? Excellent. Great to be here. And Thank sunny Chicago. <laughs> Thank you for being with us here on the Dean Show. So again. I said, that's, that's, uh, that's more than people probably have been living, uh, half a century. That's I, a, I started <laughs> as a 10-year-old boy yeah. in my father's basement in a little uh, town called Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Yeah. And I forgot to mention that you were one of the first Gracie Jiu-Jitsu certified by the Gracies to have your academy in the U.S. Well, when, when we first started out, of course, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was completely unknown. This was like 89, 90 you would say Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and people would say, well, Jiu-Jitsu is Japanese. No, 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 Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. Yeah, but it's Japanese. They just couldn't wrap their mind around the idea of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. And it was un totally unheard of until after the UFC, of course. Mm -hmm. But um, after the UFC hit, of course, there was an explosion of everyone, you know, wanting to jump on the, the gravy train. You know, yeah. like flies buzzing around the cake, as they say. Yeah. And uh, there was a lot of guys with basically fake credentials and a lot of people jumping in teaching. They had no business teaching at all. They had no teaching experience or background. So Master Elio Gracie and his oldest son, Jorion, wanted to have some type of instructor training program where they would teach you how to teach. I was the first person to graduate from that program. Now, I mentioned Hoist Gracie before I, I ask you more questions about that. You saw the uh, Hoist Gracie yeah, Shamrock, yeah, really, not one, yeah. two, but this is three. It surprised a lot of us. What was your breakdown on that? What did you, you think of the fight? This last one? This last one, yeah. This was number three. Yeah, no. Um, I mean, first of all, it just shows you the power of jiu-jitsu, you know? Uh, even though Shamrock, I'm sure, have studied and so forth, so Hoist was born on the mat, and... Uh, there was some a little controversy, you know, Ken complaining about the shot to the groin. But in the original fights, everything was going. You could do groin shots, uh, elbows to the back of the head, stomping your governors down, up kicks, all the things that are illegal now. And, of course, there was no gloves, which changes the game a lot. Mm -hmm. You know, ground and pound, it didn't really exist back then because, you know, you're going to break your hand on someone's elbow or the top of their head. So, you know... Hoist, Hoist proved, you know, what an amazing fighter he is, even now, yeah. you know? He's, there, not a, he's not a young guy anymore. There was some controversy towards the end. What you th <laughs> I, it was the closest to because when he first started, when they did the U.S., there was, no, there was no rules, there was nothing except respectful, respectfully, no eye gouging or, or groin shot, but even everything was permitted. Everything was permitted. So, yeah. I mean, to me, it was a fair fight, yeah. you know? It, it, you know, uh, it wasn't as if Hoist went out trying to get a knee shot. Yeah. I mean, it just happened in the course of the fight. Yeah. That's what happens. Yeah. You know, so I, I like. I, don't know, I was thrilled to see, see see it. 
I think I was also, it was amazing. We, I've heard you say so many times, even with all your experience, you're humble knowing that uh, you're still a student. And I'm still a student. I got my, my, my rash guard, as you see. <laughs> I heard you call it. Well, it's good with, the, uh, uh, yeah. with the sports jacket. So yeah. It's not just worn uh, uh, for nothing. Maybe right? you've uh, created a new style here. You yeah. Know? I said work, work by day, train by night. And I, there you, I, go. you come in and I was like, uh, t so much that uh, with all your years of training, so much wisdom that we can benefit from um, your experiences. And we want the audience also uh, tell us, um, being with the Gracies, this was before, like many of us, we saw the inaction or the UFC and people were fascinated, people with 10 different black belts, whatever striking arts. And, and then they saw that, wow, this is, you know, amazing that this family is able to, you know, this guy, 170 pounds, you know, and small, thin, he's taking them down, destroying people, got into uh, the jiu-jitsu uh, from this. But you were actually, this is before the UFC. This so is did you, before. Did you get to see, tell us some story. Did you get to see some Gracie in action live with these challenges? That oh, were going yeah. On? Uh, certainly did. It was really interesting because uh, m the first seminar I had was like 89. And uh, I went under protest. A friend of mine was telling me about the Gracies and their jiu-jitsu style. Being a former NCAA Division One wrestler, you know, I, I, I was pretty egotistical. You know, I figured out what, what are these guys going to show me? And uh, that first seminar, Hoyler just tapped me like a typewriter. And I couldn't believe that this little tiny guy, you know, this little skinny guy, could just basically kick my butt. And I was utterly shocked. I thought, wow, I got to learn this. You know, so many guys, that will happen to them, and then you'll never see them again. And I never understood that. Because even today, if someone had a martial art, and, you know, he, he, could, he could show me how superior it was, I would want to learn that art. And so I made it my mission. I wanted to learn Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. I just opened up my own gym at that time, mm -hmm. Maxercise. It was the first Gracie uh, training association on the Eastern Seaboard before Henzo Gracie, before any of these. Uh, we're going back to the time of even Craig Kukok. Maybe you've heard of that name, like one of the early, early guys. Mm -hmm. So uh, at that time, the Gracies had a challenge. Horion had written an article in Playboy magazine and in which he challenged anyone to come and take their martial art against Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. He would put $100,000 in there, you know? So it was true, it's not a myth, $100,000. Yeah, 100000 He put up $100,000. Yeah. And the, the person was supposed to come in and put their 100000 in, you know, one big pile, and the winner would take all. But what was happening were people were coming and challenging without the money. Mm. And of course, you know, the Gracies wanted, would, would oblige. So they were getting challenge matches at the Gracie Academy. And you can see a lot of those in the old Gracie in Action tapes. That was the first video that I had seen. Horian had made this, uh, uh, one of the original in Action tapes. Mm -hmm. And I was just blown away with, with what I saw. Mm -hmm. And um, when I opened up my school in Philly, I would get guys coming in to want to challenge us. Yeah. And I would say, well, well, wait a second, we're just blue belt, you know, purple belt. And, uh, you know, you want to call Hoyce or Orion or Hickson. And uh, they would still insist. And it developed great confidence because it was quite frightening. Some of these guys were pretty formidable-looking guys. But without the knowledge of jiu-jitsu to back them up, actually the fights were pretty easy. Pretty easy. And we weren't even that skilled at the time. Yeah. And it just proved to me how amazingly effective this martial art is, you know, mano y mano. Very yeah. hard to beat a jiu-jitsu guy if you don't know what to do on the ground. Yes. And the fight will go to the ground. That's why, without a doubt, it's been proven the most effective martial art in the world, not just by theory, but by action. By action. There's no, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not like, you know, one of these things like uh, the dim mock death touch or something mm -hmm. that is just too dangerous ever to do. I mean, you know that this stuff actually works. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we, we get guys, boxers, kickboxers, taekwondo, tang, tang sudo, uh, you know, the tough guys were always the wrestlers. Mm -hmm. That was going to be a long struggle. I remember I had this guy. He was a former uh, NCAA Division Three guy. He weighed about 210 pounds. I was, at the time, I was already in my 40s and uh, maybe 138 pounds soaking wet. I went almost 45 minutes with this guy before I finally sunk an uh, arm triangle from the guard. Yeah. And I felt like I was in a blender. He was just throwing me all over the place. But he couldn't really hurt me. He couldn't really finish me. He couldn't really do anything. And, but it built a lot of confidence, a lot of confidence.
Amazing. We're going to go ahead and take a break and we'll be right back with more with Steve Maxwell on The Dean Show. Don't go anywhere. What are we doing here and where are we going to go? It's like we just woke up one morning and then it's welcome to the show. Don't ask any questions, just go with the flow. Make as much money as you can and try your best not to get broke. Copy everything you see on the TV from the hairstyles to the clothes and don't think too often, just do exactly as you're told. And if you ever get confused, then just turn towards the alcohol. You'll still hear your thoughts. Then just turn up the radio as you learn to live a lifestyle of drugs, sex, and rock and roll. But in all honesty, I just need to know, is there more to the cycle than growing and getting old? Living and dying just to leave behind a happy home and a whole lot of property that somebody else is going to own. I just really need to know before the casket's closed Cause I'm not willing to gamble with my soul Nor am I ready to take any chances These are just simple life questions And I'm just searching for some answers Like what are we doing here? And what is our purpose? How did we get here? And who made us so perfect? And what happens once we go? Or is this world all really worth it? Subscribe right now Back here on The Dean Show with Steve Maxwell. Now, Steve, you uh, also had a chance. I mean, we got to talk a little bit about the the history uh, and how you started. And you also got to spend some time on the uh, farm with Helio Gracie. I did. It was one of the... uh, Drinking some milk. It was an amazing, uh, amazing time. Uh, Helio Gracie was a a very generous host. Uh, I had visited him around 1992, I believe it was. I went down, trained with Hoyler at the Umaita School. And then I returned later uh, when Hoyce was preparing for a, uh, a fight. And stayed there uh, about a month and got a chance to see uh, up close the Gracie diet. And of course, you know, Elliot Gracie was very, very strict about the way he ate. Uh, he was very hale and hearty right up until the very end. Very, uh, e- even when he was in his late 80s and 90s, he was still very spry and, 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 and moving around. And he knew that I liked milk, raw milk, and he would go out. He had his own dairy farm, his own chickens. He had a lake where it was stocked with fish. You know, he'd go out and catch a fish for dinner. I mean, it was pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. Uh, SIE grew on the trees right outside the house, you know, all the tropical fruits, everything. everything it was like a, like a garden of bean in there, really. Mm-hmm. And he would go out and milk the cow and bring me a big frothy pitcher of yeah. of nice raw milk. It was delicious. Real milk. Yeah, real raw. Yeah, straight but from the cow. M- many people don't know that uh, the number one allergenic food, according to the FDA, is milk. But it's not real milk. We're talking about homogenized, pasteurized, fake food, as we call it. Once they homogenize it, you know, they destroy all the natural enzymes and and, and so forth. When you get it raw, it's a whole different food from the stuff that you find in the store. Even, mil- even raw milk, though, if it's sitting around too long, uh, is, is an ideal. I mean, the ideal would be to get it, you know, right from the cow. As you were getting it. Yeah, as I was getting it. Yeah. You know, a couple of days, it's, it's okay. It quickly, because there's no preservatives or anything, you know, it quickly begins to break down. Yeah. And um, there are a lot of American health pioneers in the early days, uh, Harvey Kellogg and Bernard McFadden, some of these guys, who were very much into the milk cure where people that were suffering different ailments, instead of outright fasting, they would drink raw milk only. The only food they would take, like a monodiet, for 30 days. And there's like testimonial after testimonial as to the effectiveness of the milk cure. Gave the digestion a chance to, to, uh, to uh, relax and not be so overburdened and gave the body a chance to detoxify while still giving you some some good nutrients and calories so that you weren't so tired. I've taken water fast also as a cure, but you need to lay down and rest a lot when you're taking a water fast. Yeah. You don't have any, any energy. Plus your body's busy detoxifying. Mm. As far as detoxification, I believe water fast is superior, but they do make, you do get quite tired. Um, but a mono diet like uh, the milk cure, 
uh, is a way that if you have to work and you have duties that you just can cannot attend to, yeah. but then something like that is a really good alternative. Yeah, uh, we uh, ac we actually fast. When we fast. It's, it's usually from from sun before sunrise to sunset. No food, no drink, nothing. And then there's a new thing now with the intermittent fasting. You intermittent know? fasting. Yeah, it's, it's yeah, which it's, I've it's, done. Yeah, I kind of do a, Ma a major benefits they're discovering from. This I like thing. to push my lunch back yeah. every day to like eleven or twelve. I usually arise around between five and six. Yeah, and uh, I think there's a lot of benefit. Your body is b busy getting rid of metabolic waste from yeah. the day before in the early morning, and having a big heavy breakfast is definitely a burden on your system. Yes, better just to have nothing or eat very lightly. And this is very important. Uh, you should not be eating uh, before you have a bowel movement in the morning. I know it sounds kind of kind of gross, but it's really, really important that you eliminate before you start filling your body with food. What about water? Water's fine. St you can start, yeah, start, nice you recommend water. starting with water? Yeah. Yeah. Water in the morning. Uh, how about I, some people put I, lemon or what's the uh, apple cider vinegar? Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. You know, uh, I just drink water myself. Just water, personally. Uh, it's Bowel okay. movement and then eat. Yeah, uh, if you like a little coffee, it's okay. You know, mm. a little coffee is not a, a terrible thing. Yeah. Uh, I've, I've been into matcha tea lately. It's uh, it, it has a lot of chlorophyll in it. Yeah. And a lot of really good uh, antioxidants. Mm -hmm. And there is a mouth stimulating effect to it. There is a little caffeine in there. Yeah. So I'll usually drink matcha tea, sometimes mixed with a little coconut water. Yeah. You know? Uh, t fed, fed up. Have you seen? Forget about it. There are 600,000 food items in America. 80% of them have added sugar. Your brain lights up with sugar just like it does with cocaine or heroin. You're going to become an addict. You end up with one of the great public health epidemics of our time. This is the first generation of American children expected to lead shorter lives than their parents. This is like a catalyst that really opened my eyes, you know, to one of the, to the dangers and the importance of eating real food and staying away from, you know, one example of white processed refined sugars. One out of every three Americans will have diabetes. Those diseases are being driven by sugar. This is the fundamental problem nobody's talking about in society. And it se seems like this is something with the marketing campaign from the food industry. That's why you, you mentioned earlier the statistic almost 70 percent of people now here are, are ob obese. And, it's pretty and, bad. And the rest of the yeah. world is quickly catching yeah. up. Talk to us about Have you seen the movie? I, I, I strongly I, I did, recommend I did, that everyone watch Fed Up. It I, was like, wow. Yeah. And it's really sad. And right now in the United States, we are basically the fattest nation on earth. But China is quickly catching up. Uh, the UK, not too far behind, uh, Germany, you know, all the industrialized mm -hmm. countries in the world, uh, they're very quickly taking on the fast food addiction that the American public uh, have. And it's really undermining the health uh, the world over. Uh, I, I travel extensively. As you know, I'm a digital nomad. Yeah. I don't live in any one spot. I'm always moving to a different country. And um, even in the Middle East, I'm seeing a lot of overweight people that are not uh, eating well. Monkey see, monkey do, because we're following this, the culture, you know, the norms here, and then that stuff is just past McDonald's is uh, infiltrating. It's infiltrated everywhere. One of the saddest uh, things I ever saw, I went to what was probably one of the greatest paradises ever on earth was Tahiti. Uh -huh. And there was two McDonald's on the island of uh -huh. Tahiti. And the drive through would literally be backed up for miles. Wow. And the Tahitians were so obese. It was so sad because what a magnificent people, you know? Yeah. We're going to take a break. I'm excited. We got a lot more questions to ask you to benefit us and the viewers. We'll be right back with more. Hannah Dean Show, don't go anywhere. I want you to imagine you wake up and in front of you are a bunch of guys running around kicking a ball. No goals, no lines, no rules. What would you think? But is that your life? Surely every sport has its goal. Every game has its end. It has its objective. It has its rules. How about life? How about our life? Isn't there a goal to life? Isn't there a purpose, an objective that we have to reach? We think so. The Quran tells us that we exist in order to worship God and worshiping God means 
knowing God, as the Quran says. Worship though is not some narrow, small thing. It's wide, it's vast, it encompasses everything that the human being does. Everything that you do, everything that you think, everything that you feel can be done, thought, said, felt in a way that is either pleasing or displeasing to God. The purpose of life is to try and do everything in a way that God loves and God is pleased with. That is your goal. Subscribe right now. Back here on the Dean Show with Steve Maxwell. We're talking about fed up. Have you seen, have you heard of Ty Bollinger? The doctor is brainwashed when he gets out of medical school because the medical school has too much subsidization of the professors who are being paid by the drug company. So the professor never teaches any student in medical school. Why don't you try vitamin C? They're gonna tell them the latest drug. And that's by design, specifically. You know, there, about over a century ago, there's foundations, the Carnegie and the Rockefeller Foundations, who sort of engineer the curriculum through their uh, grants and donations. Are you wondering what Dr. McCullough meant when he mentioned that the Carnegie's and the Rockefeller Foundations engineered medical school curriculum over a century ago? He was referring to the Flexner Report of 1910, which we covered in our last documentary. This is a man whose mother and father died to cancer, and then uh, his five other family members is called the uh, Truth About Cancer Global Quest. Travel across the United States, interviewing doctors, scientists, researchers, and cancer patients to learn what they were doing to treat cancer. Have you heard of this? I have not, but strongly I, recommend it. I, I do know the cancer industry is. 50% of people living today will have cancer. Did you know that almost 50% of the people alive today will face cancer? Did you know that one in four males alive today will die from cancer? One out of four will go ahead, will die from it. And many of this, as they uncover that, go back to the food choice. 95% of chronic diseases are, are because of the food choices we're making. Well, there's no, there's no, uh, there's no accident that, that, that people are getting cancer. I mean, it's not just like something that just happens to. You know, you have to work to get it. It's not like some mysterious thing that just hits you. You know, people with these, with these type of diets and, of course, the smoking and, and so forth. Uh, but there's some uncontrollable factors, too, you know, like the environmental pollution. You know, you heard about the Flint water crisis and so forth. Yeah. Okay, there are some, some things out of your control, but a lot of this stuff is in your control. There was a turn of the American. Uh, there was a turn of the century American physician by the name of Dr. John Tilden. He uses a kind of a variation of the Gracie diet, which I follow very religiously, and uh, it's basically a food combining diet, very similar to the Gracie diet or uh, Sheldon's uh, mm -hmm. food combining diet. And Tilden, even back then, was noticing that a lot of these so-called cancers aren't real cancer; they're like a precancer, and they can still be nipped in the bud by changing your diet, primarily through fasting. And he, he cured many people. According to Tilden, once you get true cancer, it's pretty much a done deal. Mm -hmm. But there's a, there's a lot of time between where this pre-cancer type condition occurs and before you, you get the full-blown mm -hmm. cancer. I, I'm, I'm really on the, the, um, the philosophy, the way that, you know, this, um, Ty Bollinger, he goes out and he interviews, I'm not talking about, uh, you know, he first talks about the facts that most doctors, I didn't know this, they know nothing about, you know, the basics of nutrition. But if you look at the amount of training that I received, it was probably about two or three hours in medical school. Once I got out into training, my internship, my residency, which was a five year long, I don't think I got any training at all. And from then on to now, there's probably zero amount of training in nutrition. The poor things don't study nutrition at medical school and for the bulk of them post-qualification training consists of courses that are dished out to them by the pharmaceutical industry. I'm pretty skeptical uh, about the quality of the training that they receive. Having said all that, I went to med school myself. They gave us a whole hour on nutritionals. A whole hour in, a whole four, hour. in four years of medical school. Mm -hmm. And they told us there's vitamin A and B1 and B2 and C and D and they're in alphabetical order and you can look them up. And then they told us some really basic facts. 
we got a whole hour. First of all, how much training did you receive on nutrition when you were in medical school? Because I know here in the States, it's almost none. Yeah, not much. Not much? Not much. Even in Argentina? It's close to, to, yeah, yeah, very little. Close to none? Very little. Because you know, in medical school, they don't teach you. They don't teach you anything about nutrition. And about the power of food. You know, you heard of Hippocrates who said, let food be your medicine, medicine be your food. But then you have the, be the good who, who got better and they actually went be out and beyond and they talk about, you know, just giving the body what it needs to heal itself because we're always in a state of, of healing. And he goes on and talks to people all over the world who have helped to cure cancer through natural means, through proper dieting, through uh, without the chemo, which is a hundred sixty billion dollar industry. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, if I got, if I was diagnosed with cancer, I would not do chemo. I would fast. They and talk fasting, about fasting. Fasting is probably one of the most powerful cure. Tilden talks a lot about that yeah. in his book, Talk See Me Explain. And this was almost written a hundred years ago. This guy already saw the writing on the wall. He was railing against, you know, big pharma, pharmaceutical companies, yeah. and you know, drugs and so forth, but. With all this stuff too, you can't, you can't eliminate the mental, emotional, spiritual aspect of yes, the whole thing. Yes. Because a lot of these diseases are created by impure thoughts, created by negative thinking, uh, negative emotional patterns, anger, hate, jealousy, greed. If you don't eliminate this from your life, thoughts are things and they create these con negative conditions in our body. So people are overlooking that whole spiritual aspect of the whole thing. It's so important to control your thoughts and not allow yourself to be immersed in this type of negative thinking. This is a, a whole other avenue that people neglect. Another avenue yeah. that people neglect. No one's talking about this yeah. aspect of T it. Tell us now, this is what I got, I got uh, turned on to you by um, uh, my strength and conditioning coach. I believe he was uh, mentioning you and I had tuned in and it, you know, right to the uh, point of an interview, I, I believe it was you who said that you hadn't been to a doctor in 20 years? 35. 35 years. years. 35 so I years. said, I said, hold on, he's on to something. I need to talk to this man because who wants to be going to the doctor, you know, every, every uh, year, a few times a year, and then you know what? You get on drugs, and then that causes another side effect. Something's growing out of your back, out of your head, <laughs> <laughs> right? So how, how, what, what's going on? 35 years you hadn't been to yeah. the doctor? Um, if I start to feel cold or flu symptoms, I immediately will stop eating. If I absolutely must be, you know, doing stuff, I'll just go maybe on a, a basic fruit diet, something really easy to digest, and give my body a chance to eliminate any toxemia that's built up. A lot of times it's a combination of toxemia and innervation, just being overly tired. And um, if I can, I'll just take a day or two of rest and just go either all water or light fruits, bingo. You know, within a day or two, you completely turn it around, yeah. get your energy back, feel better. A lot, a lot of this stuff is caused from overeating, overburdening, the digestion, and so forth. And I do a lot of prayer and meditation because that's very important, as we were saying. You cannot neglect the spiritual aspect of disease. It's almost like a metaphor for things that are going wrong in your life. And you have to take a hard look at this. It's, it's, it's almost as if your thoughts can literally precipitate. Have you ever had a bout of anger? You know, I, I can remember in the past getting extremely angry about something, you know, maybe before I was aware of this and literally coming down with like a, a cold the next day. Stress is a killer. Stress. And you know, thing, you know, these type of negative emotions are huge stresses and they literally affect your endocrine system, uh, you know, affect every aspect of your body. And so there's yeah, no doubt about that. It's very that, important to that, to purify and uh, be pure in your thoughts. Wow. That also reminds me of my um, uh, great man I met, I had him on the program. He was sick and tired of being sick and tired. He went to the conventional doctor, just gave him more pills. That didn't help. And it wasn't until he started to do some of these things you're mentioning. He cleaned up his, his diet. He started eating right. He strengthened the immune system, cleaned up his thoughts. And he's better. He hasn't also been to the doctor in 20 some years, not as long as you. So that's a science by itself. You have people here who are taking care of the gift that the Creator has given them, this body putting in what it needs to function optimal performance 
while you have some others now, what if the, some people say, look, my doctor said, you know, eat whatever you want. And this is common amongst m many, many doctors who say it doesn't matter what you eat. Just go ahead and eat it what you want. Well, have you heard I mean, this? Look at, look at the health of the average doctor. Yeah. You know, most of these guys are not particularly healthy. I'm not going to entrust my health to a guy like that. And as you said before, in medical school, you know, they, they really don't have... One hour of nutrition. They gave us a whole hour on nutritionals. A whole hour. In a whole four, hour. In four years of medical school. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean... They just, I didn't know. That's mind-blowing. They don't have a clue. It's all about drugs, yeah. right? If you come in and say, doctor, I'm suffering pains in my joint, and he'll say, well, you're inflamed. You have inflammation. Let's take this pill or this drug to suppress the inflammation. But he doesn't look into what is the cause behind the inflammation. Why do we go to the source and get rid of what's causing the inflammation rather than just taking a harmful drug that's going to mess up your kidney and your liver and just try to suppress it? Inflammation is the na body's natural healing response. Suppressing it, it makes no sense. It's like a fever. You know, the, doc the average doctor will suppress the fever. But the fever is your body's natural healing response. You know, I mean, obviously, if it gets too high, you know, it's going to be harmful. But yeah. there's, you know, you can put cold compresses and things yeah. to bring the fever down yeah. without going to the harmful drug. Yeah. But the pharmaceutical injury, you know, it's billions and billions of dollars. Yeah. In the past 10 years, the 11 largest drug companies made $711 billion. The pharmaceutical industry isn't in the business of health and healing. It's in the business of disease management and symptoms maintenance. Whatever your symptom is, we've got a pill for it. Yeah. And they have, con they have control of modern medicine. Yeah. Where modern medicine has made great steps is, of course, emergency medicine. You know, Inter if you get, yeah. yeah, I mean, if you get busted, bust your arm. You on get the, shot up or something. Yeah, on the <laughs> jiu-jitsu mat, you know, yeah. you tap a little bit too slow. They're pretty good with, you know, putting you back together. Yeah, with, you know, you car accidents. Yeah, exactly, yeah. or bat battlefield medicine and yeah. so forth. But Chronic disease. When it yeah. comes to, like, prevention yeah. and, and degenerative-style disease, They've gone backwards, if anything. In 2013, Pharma spent upwards of $422,000 per congressman, making sure the U.S. government knew exactly what Pharma wanted. That's a lot of influence. The pharmaceutical companies are all drug dealers. Every 19 minutes, someone dies of an accidental overdose. It's the worst epidemic we face in America today. Yeah. I think they knew more 100 years ago. Wow. All you have to do is read this guy, Dr. John Tilden. It's a free PDF, by the way. Yeah. You can just go to the Soil and Health Library, and there's like a whole litany of natural healing books and so forth that's there. It's free yeah. to the public, and you can read yourself and educate yourself on the way to heal yourself without uh, modern medicine, which I think does more harm than good. This is amazing. A lot more to talk about here with Steve Maxwell. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. That's it for this week's show, guys. Steve Maxwell. He shares some really good mobility drills with me. I'm excited to continue talking with him, learning from him, and I hope you guys can join me next week as I continue on with the interview with Steve Maxwell on The D Show. Subscribe right now.